Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Edmund DeVoe. I'm president of the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association, the state's first and largest trade association to help the state establish a responsible, sustainable, diverse, and profitable cannabis industry. I want to welcome you to another fabulous segment of Lunch and Learn, as uh, you may be joining us for the first time or maybe even a repeat attendee. I encourage you to use the chat feature to network, put in your personal information, your contact information, uh, network there, and uh, be sure to click everyone, not just panelists, so that everyone can see your information. Uh, as we are preparing uh, to get into our conversation, I want to acknowledge uh, upcoming events. Tuesday, March 17th, we are having our in-person networking event in New Brunswick from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Blackthorn, Blackthorn Irish Restaurant and Pub, located on Church Street, 61 Church Street in New Brunswick. That's this coming Tuesday. We'd love to see you there. Don't forget that there is a CRC meeting um, on May 24th. Would love to see uh, how much farther we're moving the industry forward. Uh, I want to pause there and thank uh, Senate President Scatari. I want to thank uh, Judiciary Chairman Brian Stack, Senator Brian Stack, uh, for their invitation uh, yesterday. I had the opportunity to testify about access to capital uh, in Trenton uh, with the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, the uh, other testimonies came from other great individuals from the advocacy uh, community, people like Ken Walski, Leo Bridgewater, uh, Bill Caruso. Uh, so these were people that were there, uh, again, sharing their advocacy point of view for the industry. Again, Senate President Skatari, thank you. Uh, Chairman Stack, thank you for the invitation uh, to uh, be with you yesterday. Uh, you can find copies of uh, my remarks I believe uh, on our website, and if not, I know that uh, some of the media outlets in fact did uh, run at least excerpts of my comments. So we should put it on the website. So I think that's what we'll do. Uh, so that was great. Uh, I also wanna thank our sponsors. Lunch and Learn sponsors today, Argus 365, a security company, Burton Trent Public Affairs, Curaleaf, current ATC and board member, I want to thank Financial Resources Federal Credit Union. Uh, great outfit. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank Garden State Greenhouse. Puffin, entrepreneurs and investors. Nathan, I see that you're here. Thank you always for your support. Sachs, LLP. Sheet Metal Workers, Local 19. Sprague Energy. Siska Hennessy, Engineering Group. The UFCW, Locals 360 and 152, and Weeds Direct. So before I introduce our current guest, uh, I do want uh, to share a photo. Uh, as if I didn't have enough stuff to do, uh, I uh, left Trenton and ended up uh, at a uh, event called Dine Below the Line. Uh, it just so happens I do work with my church's food pantry. And sure enough, uh, at this event, which brings awareness uh, to food insecurity, I happen to run into Mr. Jason Friedman of the Carpenters. Uh, this just speaks volumes, not only of Jason, but of the Carpenters as an organization. Uh, while we prepare to have a professional conversation and talk about what it is that the Carpenters and their associated contractors bring uh, to the cannabis industry, I just wanted to pause and share that uh, why New Jersey Cannabis Business Association supports organized labor. It's not just about the professionalism. It's not just about what they bring to the industry, but it is things like this. They give so much to the community at large. And uh, just when you think uh, you're, you're not going to see someone, here's someone representing uh, the organization extremely well talking about uh, all of the charity work that you do. So Carla, thank you so much for sharing. I just wanted to share that. And uh, so with that, I wanna thank you for joining us, Anthony Abrantes, Michael Travestino, and Rob Smith. I wanna thank you for joining us. And uh, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to you 
so that you can introduce yourselves and share your role uh, with the organization. Go ahead, Ed. Thanks, Mike. Uh, first and foremost, Ed, thanks for obviously having us on. Uh, you guys have been great industry partners from the beginning, and uh, I couldn't thank you enough. So a, a little bit about myself. Uh, I do represent the Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters as the Assistant Executive Secretary Treasurer, uh, the number two uh, executive in our jurisdiction. Uh, currently, we're representing New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, uh, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. Uh, my primary focus primarily is, uh, similar to this year, is focusing on business development and creating opportunities, not only for our members, but our contracting partners and uh, finding ways to really uh, stimulate the economy and move things in the right direction. Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Mike Travestino, Government Affairs Director for the Associated Construction Contractors of New Jersey. We're a statewide trade association here uh, in the Great Garden State, uh, representing hundreds and hundreds of contractors engaged in multiple disciplines uh, from your vertical building construction heavy highway civil, uh, certainly specialty contractors as well, engaged in utility, marine, et cetera. Um, our association prides ourselves on our relationships with our labor partners. And I uh, just wanna underscore this morning or this afternoon for everybody, uh, if we were operating or broadcasting from any other state in, in, the, in the great country we live in, you would not have labor and management uh, on the same Zoom panel. Uh, we are unique and we truly work uh, and have a hand in glove working relationship with our labor partners, uh, highly skilled trained craft workers, and we represent uh, highly skilled trained contracting firms. Uh, so again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, excited to, for any discussion and any inquiries. And uh, thank you again for my colleagues for the invite. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so thanks, Ed and, and Carla, uh, for the opportunity to be here today. It's a true pleasure. Uh, my name is Rob Smith. I am the Supervisor of Instruction uh, for the uh, Northeast Carpenters uh, Apprentice Training Fund out of the state of New Jersey. However, as Anthony described uh, so eloquently, all the states of our regional council, I am also deployed throughout all that entire region um, supporting training as well. So I, it's kind of twofold. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, the great things that we have is we have about 4,500 students in our programs. Um, just to really talk about the, the gravity of jobs and job growth. Um, and we're training for whatever skills are necessary uh, to meet contractors, labor demands like Mike's group and various groups like the ACCNJ across, the, uh, across our council. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, I look forward to, uh, to the discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. So as we get right into it, uh, last week, we had the pleasure of having Siska Annecy, uh, one of our uh, corporate members and sponsors, uh, talking about, as we look at the, the importance of facilities. Uh, here, here in New Jersey, as we learn from other states, there is no such thing as a cultivation facility that's ready to walk into. There's no such thing as a retail space that you're ready to walk into. Uh, it's not like buying a house uh, where it comes with bathrooms and comes with closets. We are creating everything from scratch. So at this point, so as the engineer said, you should call us early and call us often. So when it comes to the uh, carpenters and other trades, uh, when should we call you in this process where we have applicants that are looking for uh, suitable properties or looking for real estate? When do you get the call? So Ed, uh, I'll kick it off because I think I, I need to lay the, the groundwork to kind of how we got here. Um, I know for the carpenters and other trades and, and you know, the, our contractors, we've been advocates from day one. Uh, once we realized there was an emerging market in cannabis business, not just in New Jersey, but some of our other states, uh, we wanted to take advantage of that opportunity. Not every day do we see an opportunity where we can actually create opportunities like workforce development or jobs for our contractors. Um, so one of the first things we did was lobby with our elected officials to make sure this actually moved forward. Um, you know, once once we got that through and it's kind of bring us to where we are today and some of the questions you're asking, uh, we started talking directly to developers and investors on how we become better advocates in making things uh, come to fruition. How do we get through the red tape uh, to make these jobs happen a lot faster? Uh, and 
in addition to that, the reality is there was other reasons and, and there's selfish reasons, right? We obviously want to see workforce development created in New Jersey. We want to make sure they're good paying jobs and we want to make sure the jobs in underserved, upper, upper, underrepresented communities um, that need opportunity. Um, in addition to that, the contractor side of it, we want to make sure that local small businesses, veteran owned businesses, minority women owned businesses have an opportunity to take advantage of what's actually happening in the market. And uh, to your point, uh, I think that making sure we get ahead of things uh, to make sure we're addressing issues of the developers and people investing in this industry, uh, that we're actually addressing those concerns sooner than later. Uh, I think we're there now. Uh, we're to a point that we can hopefully see all this kind of translate into some community and economic wealth for not only the companies and the investors and the, and the workforce, but society as a whole that's gonna reap uh, the benefits. And I can tell you, We've been preparing for this moment probably for the last couple of years since this has been out there. And we've been training new apprentices, recruiting new apprentices, expanding our market share with contractors, um, teaching them to technology that needs to be learned for these type of facilities and making sure we actually have the workforce ready. So we are ready, we're able, the contractors are ready and able. It's just a matter of having those conversations with those developers, investors, landowners, and let's put shovels in the ground. That's great, let me, Anthony. Thank you. Ed, let me just jump in here real quick. Anthony, as usual, hit the nail on the head and a, a pun intended there. Um, let's just talk for a second and drill down on the scopes of work because you really just identified, right, a myriad of different applications here and, and where not only your association's membership, but, you know, to your point about your last panel or your last program and, and the developer community, um, we have a lot of innovative tools. Anthony and Rob representing the EAS Carpenters, not only are they ready, willing, and able, they have tools available to make our contractors competitive. We recognize that there could be some public money ultimately, whether it's the CRC, EDA, different state agencies who will be uh, you know, promoting and or rolling out future programs to enhance this industry. But let's just take two kind of quick segments because you described, right, the, uh, the recreational, you know, facility itself where growing activity is going on, but there's also the retail aspect too. So if we're talking about a, a main street, if you will, or, you know, even, um, you know, off of a county highway or et cetera, an existing facility that could be repurposed, uh, this trade right here, the carpenters are, are most likely the best suited trade to retrofit an existing storefront, right? And, and in an efficient, an efficient way, which is important. If we're talking more larger construction, bigger footprint, uh, warehousing type of facility, again, no better trade to be speaking with or running down, you know, business opportunity leads with that trade, uh, the carpenters or my, our organization. And again, true, I want to underscore again, the, the hand in glove working relationship, because uh, again, the applications of and the footprint of these facilities may differ. A, a retail setting is going to have completely different needs than a 50,000 square foot warehouse. Um, but again, we have tools and, and we could have some further conversations, you know, after this panel with anybody who would like to explore those opportunities. And again, the tools that we have as an industry. Uh, but, but just again, want to kind of squarely put that away for folks on the other end of this webinar. We recognize that the needs for not only the developer community, but some of these businesses that want to get up off the ground, you know, there's going to be no one size fits all. And uh, again, to, to, to piggyback off and ready, willing and able to engage in those discussions, regardless of what that scope of work ultimately looks like. So Ed, if I, if I could add to the conversation to the, just to round this out, um, what we're talking about with our contractors, we're at the ready, we have a, a pre-apprenticeship program right now. Um, as we start to um, make those steps into the community, looking at that underserved population that Anthony talked about, uh, that we have a pre-apprenticeship program that I'm um, looking to, you know, create diversity and get the communities involved in registered apprenticeship. We uh, have recently been awarded a PACE grant through the state of New Jersey. So we are uh, for pre-apprenticeship growth. Uh, so we have an 18 month contract with uh, the state of New Jersey for the PACE grant. And we'd be looking to take, you know, members of the community into our, into our trade um, and put them to work on these facilities as we, um, to, you know, really take people and, uh, you know, we've had a, a few uh, experiences with the CARP program, um, not just in New Jersey, it's relatively new in New Jersey, started in Philadelphia back in 2017. Um, it's now expanded to about 75 uh, kids 
uh, that are going through the CARP program and being placed into an employment after they successfully complete. Um, I was proud to say I was one of the first instructors of the program and one of the co-authors of the program in Philadelphia and uh, back in 2017 and our first graduates are coming through the program now as full journey persons making full scale rate, um, not just apprentice rate. So it's a prideful thing for me. It's really made an impact uh, on, uh, you know, people, um, you know, changing their life. I've gotten a phone call from from a gentleman saying, you know, hey, Rob, you got to tell me if I pass the test. He says, I says, oh, yeah, says, why? What's that? And he says, because it's going to change my life. And when you're when you're, uh, you know, making those type of impacts on people's lives, it, it really makes a difference. It makes what you do uh, worthwhile. And I think that's some of the synergy that we share um, as a group. You know, that that that's brilliant. And, uh, you know, it's th this has been one of the challenges that I've taken on personally as we talk about uh how, how do you make money in this industry, right? Who's who's welcome in the industry? And so oftentimes, and uh, my, my vice president, uh, Dr. Marianne Bays is on board. And, uh, she can attest to this. Uh, she's on the webinar today. Uh, we've always talked about, you don't have to touch the plant to be part of the cannabis industry. And when we talk about what's profitable and how you talk about life changing, uh, learning a skill. And I again, I wanna welcome the sheet metal workers. I know they're here, uh, they're attending. Uh, and, and so when we talk about how do, how do I get into the industry, this is clearly a way of getting in. It, it's not plant touching, but it is such a, a, an, an integral part of how we make this industry stand up. Whether you're out on a uh, on an industrial strip or, or whether you're on Main Street, and so uh, if you guys want to just feed into that a little bit more, because I think it's so important. Uh, so many of the people that that will watch the webinar uh, either today or in the future, uh, I just want to encourage them, and as they are working with family members, as they're working with uh, other members of their community. How, how we get the word out uh, that you don't have to just touch the plant to be successful. You don't just have to touch the plant to be part of this industry. So. Yeah, yeah I could, uh, you wanna go in? You go ahead. Yeah, real, real quick. And I think Ed, you, you nailed it on the head. Um, you know, the way we're looking at it is that we're not gonna limit ourselves to just one industry, one sector, right? But this industry in particular, being that it's emerging, is creating so much opportunity in other sectors, right? We're talking about growing, we're talking about manufacturing, distribution, all the logistics, the warehousing, the operations, the storage, that creates additional opportunities that are not directly correlated to what's happening at the growth facility, right? So it's not just cannabis, it's so many other industries that we're gonna be able to take advantage of because of one market. And uh, I think that's where the value is when we're talking about emerging markets is how does that impact other sectors and create a broader sense of workforce. And uh, we're willing to take advantage of that across the board, regardless of what the, the trade is. Great, great. So let's, let's jump into the, the supply chain, if you will. Uh, I'm getting ready for my application. Uh, so a couple of things I'm looking to do. One is, uh, and, and I want you to address both and you can decide who, who addresses it. One is the aspect of labor peace agreements. Uh, we, we've talked about how they're a part of the application where as an applicant, as a future license holder in the cannabis industry, I, I am making an effort to say, I am not going to restrict access uh, to or by uh, organized labor. So labor peace agreement, important part of the application process, as well as uh, being able to provide site plans or, or site schematics. Uh, how do I get to good contractors? How do I get to the people that are going to do the right thing? Great question, Ed. Um, and and uh, it's not necessarily one-stop shopping. Uh, but I, I think based on your your last week's program and, and you gave us, you know, a little bit of education on that and how that ultimately went, uh, that's another team process, right? You have the contractor, the architect, 
the engineer, especially in, in the world of, of a private space, act as a team. It, it, it's, it's inherent. It's, uh, it's incumbent upon that team uh, to not only be forward thinking, uh, to meet the demands or the needs of the client, uh, but also cover all those bases uh, that, that several you know, industry experts in this new emerging market are, are not necessarily used to. Right, botany and, and all that goes into it. Anthony, Rob, and I necessarily couldn't speak to that, but we certainly could speak to what you just uh, you know inquired about. So, ACCNJ, my contact information will certainly be made available, as will Anthony and Rob. Uh, we talk regularly. It's about facilitating that conversation. Anthony's focus, as he as he rightly said, business development. So, Ed, you have a lead. Let's let's just let's just tack this out and and, and offer up a real time example. Uh, we end this Zoom call in 20 minutes. There is a, a, a lot of good feedback. You're getting some inquiries on, okay, we're interested. What do we do now? I think it's incumbent upon right the leadership that's on this Zoom representing labor and management to field that inquiry, talk amongst ourselves, uh, and then ultimately build out what could be uh, not necessarily a cherry pick list, but here's ACCNJ's directory of mid-level contractors who are experts in interior systems and quick turnarounds uh, for, for clients. Again, with some of the tools that we can talk about on another day. Um, if we're talking about, again, you used the word industrial, uh, I think that's gonna be fitting. That, that's certainly gonna be a part of this, this emer new emerging market. Uh, and not only would a land use attorney make sense there, uh, but also good relations with you know the contracting community and our labor partners because uh, we're certainly influential in some of those local and or regional, if not state spaces. Uh, so again, not necessarily one-stop shopping, but uh, you have some industry leaders that are certainly being attentive to this market. And again, I think it's a reoccurring theme. We're ready, willing, and able. Just just also quickly, not, I, I saw in the chat, you know, Anthony will back me up on this. Uh, it's You have two carpenter reps and a management rep here today. Uh, but certainly our brothers, sisters in, in labor from, from all hosts, not just the major civil trades, but right our specialty trades as well. And sub signatory subcontractors will obviously play a vital role from whether it's HVAC systems, security alarms, and, and, and the high voltage stuff, which is going to be a huge part of any mm -hmm. cannabis business and or footprint. Um, so just want to, we'd be remiss if we didn't recognize our other labor partners associated with this event. Mike, I think that's that's a great point. Uh, <clears throat> what we're looking for is to uh, to create that that industry uh, awareness, right? The way we can create opportunities for our new apprentices. Oh, we're looking to grow as well as an organization. When nobody's looking to regress here um, and go back, so we're looking to grow as well. We've had a model of registered apprenticeship programs in the state of New Jersey for over 67, over 75 years almost now. So we have a track record of training the next generation of workers to be at the ready to service those mid-level contractors that Mike hit on. Um, and we're looking to grow as, as all the other trades are as well. Uh, we work hand in glove, you know, as far as the registered apprenticeship and training standards and programs. Um, we all have that and, we're, and we like to support those responsible contractors. And Ed, just to touch on, you had mentioned the peace agreements and how that was kind of part of the application process. Um, I know not only the carpenters, but across the board, there's 15 trades that actually, you know, would be involved in, in construction. Um, there's been peace agreements throughout the state of New Jersey. I know we've executed some, the billet trades have executed some specific to developers, right? So, you know, if you have a developer that's looking to go into a certain community and usually there's several applications going in, we've partnered with each and every one of them to support the application, but also to sign that peace agreement so that when that project does come to fruition and they get to work, everyone knows what the expectations are. We know what the workforce needs are and workforce development. If there's community-based needs that we need to address, we're proactively addressing those. And it's been a pretty good partnership. And, and to Mike's point, to Rob's point, it's, it's 15 different trade organizations that are trying to bring this all together. That's great. So uh, changing gears a little bit, uh, again, referring to our, uh, our membership and those people that, are, that will eventually uh, be part of the association at some point, uh, many of them, this is going to be the first time that they're, that they're even looking at things like uh, leasing or acquiring a building. This will be the first time uh, that maybe this is 
uh, work beyond just home home remodeling or or home repairs. Uh, could you share uh, from each of your perspectives some do's and don'ts uh, as it relates to hey, I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm thinking, I heard what Michael said. I'm going to call Mike and say, hey, I'm looking for a contractor. Or somebody's going to say, look, uh, I'm not I'm not interested in being an apprentice, but if I want to keep this in the family, uh, maybe I'm the applicant, but I want my little brother or my little sister to be part of an apprenticeship program so that they can help me along the way. But what are some do's and don'ts as people are considering reaching out to you probably for the first time? Well, Ed, kudos to you for having that thought on just again, you you know, you know your association and you certainly know the audience uh, that's that's watching this broadcast today, but really appreciate the thought that, right, maybe you, you've made the statement, this isn't necessarily or doesn't have to be about physically touching the quote unquote plant. And this could be a, a workforce development issue uh, that that Anthony and Rob have certainly spoke to. On the do's and don'ts, one of Rob's last statements, he used a, a coin phrase, really important. Uh, we pride ourselves on it, not only Anthony and Rob and, and our association here, but and that's the term responsible. You 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 want responsible contractors here in the state. There are enough fly by nights. Anthony and Rob have to deal and navigate in you know six to nine other different states and jurisdictions. We'd like to think that we're unique here in New Jersey and ACCNJ, uh, not just because I work here, we do represent the best and brightest. So you wanna look for a responsible contractor. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to be a part of our fold, but you're gonna look for some key elements here. And that is, at least I would list out for you guys, that would be past work performance. Uh, there is enough information out there on construction firms websites uh, that you can look at either prerequisites or past work experience. So if you're looking for an interior systems contractor, you don't necessarily need to look towards somebody who's building, you know, mega projects, if you will. And, and I'm not certainly not shrinking the basket of, of those who you should be looking at. But again, to back to my point on my earlier comments are right at the top here, um, identifying what your need is and the scope of work then leads you to that responsible contractor. Uh, but certainly past work history, uh, prerequisites, uh, there's enough uh, important databases at the state level where you can kind of check and see whether contractor A, B, or C is in good standing uh, with state agencies and state departments. That's usually a good indicator. Um, there are, are a lot of contractors that operate exclusively in the private space. Um, Anthony and Rob would be great kind of kick the tire gut checks on whether or not they are quote unquote responsible or, or another coin phrase we use, good actors in the industry. Um, so those are just some, I don't wanna say necessarily do's and don'ts, but those are some flags. Uh, and again, and some tools that you that your membership might have at their advantage to tap into, you know, who is, uh, who's best suited for their project. And Ed, to kind of piggyback off what Mike said, you know, outside of peace agreements, which really focus on the labor component, uh, as a developer, you don't want to inherit the liability of bad practices based on your general contractor or subcontractor or multiple levels of subcontractors. So, you know, there is language out there that we could provide or anybody could provide, you know, that talks about sustainability, you know, protects you against liability, but also protects the job sites and creates good opportunity, whether they're union or non-union. Um, that's been very effective in deterring those bad actors from getting into certain markets. So we'd be happy to share that with whoever is interested. Um, one of the do's I would say, and this is extremely important to actually having construction move forward and, and Mike and the contractors can really attest to this is, it's not always easy to navigate permitting process in New Jersey. Um, so I would say, reach out to a friend, a colleague, um, to build a rapport or relationship wherever you expect to build. So you can help expedite that process because it could be challenging. And if I could add as well, um, <clears throat> what we look for, you know, what you could be looking for when we talk about those responsible contractors, part of our organization with the registered apprenticeship program, we're made up of a joint committee that govern a board of trustees that govern our apprenticeship training funds. So it's contractors from Mike's group and other groups, you know, or maybe even independent contractors or whatever, but we have contractors that are bought into training. 
to training New Jersey's future. And if you have those contractors that are, that are in that harmony already or in that kind of dynamic of we're bought in on training, we understand how we train the next generation, then why not utilize those contractors that are already bought in and investing their own money in into making sure that, uh, you know, uh, somebody's cousin, you know, in with the cannabis industry or a brother or whatever could, you know, serve a registered apprenticeship and learn a craft and learn a trade. So those contractors, those, those good responsible contractors are already making that commitment before you even get to know who they are just by being associated with the union. Great. That, that's great feedback. And thank you so much for that. Uh, kind of going down that road, uh, you know, everyone hates to read in the paper or hear on the news uh, when you when you hear of accidents. God forbid that there's a fatality. Uh, the cost. What's the cost of not doing it right? Uh, so many times we 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 think, well, maybe I'll cut this corner. I can come back to it. Uh, some cases. There is no coming back, at least in my mind. So share share your thoughts, even uh, some real life scenarios, the cost of not doing it right. Hey Mike, I'll, I'll go first and then that way, you know, about the training piece, so you can talk about the cost piece on the contractor side. Yeah, of course. But I think, you know, Ed, to the point that, you know, whether it's one of the 15 trades uh, that I think in New Jersey probably represents over 150,000 craftspeople, men and women that went through an apprentice program, we're investing in those apprentices directly. That investment is not coming from the developers or the government, right? And part of that investment goes to ensure that we're creating not only the most productive, skilled, and qualified people in the industry, but they're doing it in a safe manner, right? Because safety matters, and obviously the liability to contractors and their ratings of performance matters. Um, so for us, while there might be a premium to doing something union because you're getting a better craftsperson and you're doing good by the community and creating wealth, the reality is we're eliminating the burden and we're creating total value. And that's where I think the contractors see the benefit. Yeah, man. Anthony, Anthony. Mike, can I jump in there real quick before you go? Okay. All right, just to piggyback off what Anthony's saying. Um, so I'm an OSHA 500 instructor. Um, I taught for 10 years. Uh, and, and, you know, tried to convey after being a shop steward or a foreman or a uh, superintendent out in the field, um, the importance of the, the group that you train to get them to know the importance of how we want you to go home safe at the end of the day. Right. So that's at the that's at the that's at the precipice of everything that we do. You know, we want our members as a part of this organization, as a part of working for these contractors and the contractors do, do as well. They want them to go home safe, number one, but they also want them to retire in 30 years, 30, 35 years with, with, a, with a good quality of life, right? We don't want you getting injured on a job or maimed on a job, God forbid, right? You want to make sure that people go home at the end of the day. And the cost of knocking on somebody's door to me is, you know, is saying, hey, I'm sorry, your, your husband or wife is not coming home. Your spouse isn't coming home today. Or your son or daughter is not coming home today. That's that's a hell of a thing to, to bear. So we try to be proactive with our training methods and our relationships to make sure that that doesn't happen. But thank you. I just want to add that. Sorry, Mike. No, you're good, Rob. I echo echo my, my, my brothers in labor's comments. They're, they're not only spot on, but, but we use that regularly. A lot of us attend, uh, you know, apprenticeship graduation classes. Um, that is a message that that from day one of your apprenticeship to right graduation day is is hit home regularly. And that's get we everybody labor and management wants craft workers of all stripes to get back to their families safe at night. Um, I will just take the cut corner piece and just dovetail it into something we were just previously talking about, Ed. And, and to Anthony's point earlier about permitting, there, there's an issue right there. There's where if you don't navigate local and or county government, and, and we all know that everyone is is attuned and watching what the CRC does regularly and will we'll follow the letter of the law and the regulatory provisions that subsequently follow. But at the local and or county level, if you are not navigating uh, land use ordinances, uh, certificate of occupancy, uh, responsible contractor uh, provisions at local, right, at town, city, or county levels, and you run afoul of that, not only do you potentially delay your project, 
but you delay its viability and, and, and its potential success. So, you know, from a get hip on ultimately what needs to be done from a permitting perspective um, and don't cut corners there, but certainly, certainly do not cut corners for the safety of the men and women of the building trades. And, uh, and certainly our contractors pride ourselves on, on keeping everyone safe. Thank you so much for that information. Uh, again, when, when we talk about the newcomers to the industry, many are not just newcomers to the cannabis industry, they're newcomers to industry, period. So it's important as you're looking at your ledger uh, that you're putting in uh, your checklist. I need to speak with these professionals. I need to contact these organizations in order for me to get this right. Uh, so in the time we have remaining, I want to make sure that you put your information, your contact information in the chat feature for our guests. Uh, I want to just highlight a couple of the points that you made. Uh, so for example, uh, the, the fact that cannabis buildings, your operational buildings, they're going to have to meet code, local, state, county code. Uh, we're going to need to, in fact, have you uh, as part of this process uh, early and often. I uh, want to also highlight what you shared with respect to you're not just about opportunity in terms of just the cannabis industry. You are, in fact, opportunity uh, for, for people and, and, in fact, can create life-changing opportunity. And, and we would be remiss if, if we were to be so selfish as to say that, oh, all we care about is if you're going into the cannabis industry. Uh, shame on us if, if that's our conversation. We really have to look at, as I shared uh, in my testimony yesterday uh, to judiciary, we're talking about putting people in a race, a uh, hundred yard dash, but they don't have cleats. They don't have starting blocks. They're 100 yards from the finish line. And by the way, the rest of the pack is already 50 yards in front. And so when we talk about life changing and what's important, being part of an industry, being part of a professional association could in fact in and of itself be life changing. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, so any, uh, any last thoughts, any last things that you want us uh, to take away uh, with respect to uh, who you are, why you're so important, and how we reach out to you, and why we reach out to you. And I'll, I'll go. And this this is in, in really in broader terms, and I think um, not just this market, which we're calling emerging, but let's just overall as a society, right? So you know, as we talk about union jobs, apprenticeship, creating wealth, creating opportunity you know, giving people a good wage with benefits and the ability to retire. Um, what most people don't realize is how that translates into other opportunity. And, and I'll take union pension funds, for example, whether you're public sector or private sector, and there's 15 different trades here. Uh, one of the things that people fail to forget, and this is because we're making good, a good living, is that those funds are reinvested in other markets, particularly cannabis or REITs, or infrastructure or public piper partnerships. So when we're looking at creating good jobs that have retirement abilities, we're also creating wealth in other sectors that have nothing to do with that worker. So, you know, the one thing I don't want to, you know, under, you know, I want to make sure we focus on is for carpenters and for the trades and for Mike, we're, we're pro business, we're pro development, we're capitalists, just not at the expense of the worker, because if we drive down the cost of labor and we suppress workers, the reality is that's going to impact everybody in the end, not just the workforce. Okay. Tell you what, I'm going to interject here because I did did see two questions that came up, uh, I think uh, would be important to, to address. Uh, one question, is it common for contractors to charge a fee uh, for cost estimates based on review of architectural drawings or, or specs? and what's considered reasonable. Is it common for contractors to charge a fee for cost estimates? The terminology is slightly off ed and, and certainly no short pants on whoever made that inquiry. A cost estimate uh, would be something that the contractor would ultimately be looking for. So you have your architect and your engineer 
put kind of plans and specs together. It would be the contractor looking for from those design professionals what they see or view the ultimate cost is. Um, there's some real basic, you know, math, including cost per square foot. And back to one of my earlier statements, it really kind of depends on applicability or what the scope of work uh, is for for whether it's your association member or or a developer on behalf of said association member. Um, so as far as a contractor kind of charging a kind of business association or a developer a fee to kind of review plans and specs, it would, it would almost be you would invite the contractor to take a look at those plans and specs. Um, and the cost estimate piece would, would be most likely something determined by the design professional, um, whether they're, they're looking for a price quote, and that's ultimately the terminology or what ultimately the, the, the individual looking on this inquiry is. Um, if it was a price quote, I, ultimately, you know, it depends contractor to contractor, you know, who, who views that as an estimating department fee and overhead, et cetera. Um, but if it's more specific and or nuanced, again, I, I drop my email into the chat. Uh, anyone on this webinar or, or views it, you know, a week from now can certainly tap into us on their specific inquiry. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, some people are having experience where they're being charged for the quote. So uh, that's, that's, I guess, that experience. That's not traditional, Ed. I mean, yeah. the, right. the incentive is for a contractor to provide you with a quote, be competitive, productive, meet the times and schedules, give you a good product, and hopefully they get the job. That's where they make their money. If someone's looking for money on the front end to bid the job, that I probably would not give that contractor the job. Great. That's I think that's the answer. That cuts to the chase. I echo Anthony's comments on that. All right. So here, here's another question, uh, and I, I, I think I'll address it. Is it up to the contractor to make sure all requirements are met? Now, there's a difference between building or construction code and land use and zoning, uh, unless you, you guys want to take that, right? So there's building code that the contractor helps you uh, obtain, but zoning and land use, that, that's done by the zoning officials. They create the the use of the of the property. So if you just want to chime in there. Yeah, Ed, some of those, what you just hit on would be contained like and, and subject to contractual terms. Um, I was speaking before about certificate of occupancy, right? A key provision for a contractor delivery date, start, you know, commencement date of construction and ultimately when it's going to ultimately be turnkey. Those would be like really important provisions as far as the land use and ordinance. Although Anthony, Rob and myself could probably wax poetic on that. M more likely a scenario in which you're engaging a legal professional to navigate th those realms. Certainly, I think uh, your audience knows there's a complex kind of myriad of statutes and or regs, you know, draped over, right? State, county, local levels. Um, but specifically, most of the contractor's role and or the agreement struck would be, you know, subject to that that contractual uh, obligation and or terms. Great. Guys, I can't thank you enough for taking uh, so much time uh, with us today and sharing your expertise and knowledge. Uh, I just want to thank you once again. I want to thank our sponsors, uh, Argus 365 Security, Burton Trent Public Affairs, Curalief, an ATC and board member, Financial Resources Federal Credit Union, Garden State Greenhouse, Huffin Entrepreneurs and Investors, Sachs LLP, Sheet Metal Workers Local 19, Sprague Energy, Siska Hennessy Group, the UFCW Locals 360 and 152, Weeds Direct. I want to thank you all for being with us today. I uh, also want to highlight Tuesday, May 17th, we have our in-person networking event in New Brunswick from 6 to 8. Please visit our website, NewJerseyCannabusiness.com, for that and other upcoming events. Uh, again, I want to thank Michael Travestino, Anthony Abrantes, and Rob Smith. I want to thank you so much for information on the carpenters and contractors, how you work together, and the value you bring to the cannabis industry and to potential property owners, site owners, and site developers. Guys, again, thanks so much for what you do.
Thanks, Ed, and thank you for your thank team. You, Great opportunity for everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Nicely done. Thank you. Everyone, thank you for joining. Enjoy the weekend. Again, this is Ed DeVoe, president of the New Jersey Cannabis Association.